Iris, you just recently and a number of other international donors launched the Global Donor Working Group on Land. It is the first one comprising donors from all regions of the world, and uh, DFID is the first chair of the group. What motivated the members to form this group? You know that donors talked seriously about forming a global donor working group for the first time at the April land conference of the World Bank. Donors had recognized that although in some countries donor coordination groups also on land worked reasonably well, this was by no means the case internationally. We have some good efforts, but globally, outside of external meetings and annual conferences, there is no standing body that helps information exchange and especially coordination. So that was the main um, impetus for us to set up this group. What is your immediate aim, your overall aim with the group? Land has risen up on the global agenda extremely fast after the first food price spike 2007-2008. Um, so for all development donors, this is a huge opportunity, but also we see a huge risk if uh, current land investments and future land investments are not done well and designed well and done transparently, then this might undermine poverty reduction and sustainable development as opposed to what we want to achieve, um, secure land rights supporting um, better economic development and poverty reduction. So that led us to define four principal objectives, and one of them is to improve information exchange, to um, support lessons learning, and avoid what happens very often in the development world, that's where all of us are motivated, we want to find a solution, but we keep reinventing the wheel, just because we don't have enough mutual lessons learning. We also want to improve donor coordination at the international level, and hope by supporting and improving coordination internationally, we will also help um, um, fuel and feed coordination at the regional and at the national level and vice versa. And we have agreed to um, define joint action and policy measures wherever that is suitable. You mentioned already knowledge exchange and, and all these uh, things that we hear quite often in, in that whole arena. One thing that comes to my mind is there any any new way that you're trying to interact in any critical thinking to, to make that really happen and bring this to, to fruition, if you will? Well, we are just in the process of agreeing on our priorities for the work plan for the first year or two. And on that agenda, we definitely have two main priorities. And one of them is to define as much as possible joint positions on the post-2015 agenda. I think we're all agreed that we think um, a land-related target, land tenure security and property rights-related target, would be great in a post-2015 framework. And we're also discussing what a global indicator set could be to measure progress in this direction towards improved land governance. That's certainly one short-term priority where better donor coordination can, can um, make a significant contribution. The other one, of course, is, and I'm also speaking on behalf of the UK here, we see that the donor working group can help us move forward the new land partnerships that we have agreed at this year's um, G8 summit, that um, those partnerships with seven initial developing countries who are um, have committed to implementing the voluntary guides, uh, guidelines on land tenure. This is an important step, and we need all the support that we can get. These partnerships have committed to implementing the recently agreed global voluntary guidelines on land tenure in order to learn lessons and um, also scale up success stories along the way. Um, we can use all the support we can get, and the donor working group has agreed to make that one priority of its work plan. So um, we see the donor working group as an important tool to exchange those lessons, to showcase success stories, but also to um, help um, communicate with external st stakeholders and synergize activities towards this objective. Can others still join the donor working group? It is open. The terms of reference are on the web page of the Global Donor Platform, which has a sub-page for this new working group. And um, it lists the initial founding members, but it also lists conditions of how new members can join. And we're happy to receive expressions of interest. You mentioned already the fruit price hikes. 
One question that comes to your mind is why has it taken so long to form this group? I know that there was an EU working group on land and other other developments. And if it's so useful, why why does it take so long? And or is it good that it takes longer? Does it need that? Generally, coordination is a challenge, and in the development world, that's not an exception. Um, with all kinds of stakeholders, it is a challenge to seek better coordination, and that's also the case among donors. Donors have less and less money and need to ensure better value for money for their investments, but they also um, need to think twice about what they put their staffing capacity in. So um, the smaller the donors are, the less opportunity they have to um, engage in lots of coordination measures. In addition, we should also be frank. Um, coordination is always a bit like herding cats, and we are very pleased that we have made such great strides in this case that um, all donors are agreed that land is of incredible importance towards boosting sustainable development, and that we need to get it right and that we want more value for money and impact of, out of the programs that we're funding, and therefore coordination is a good step. So ultimately, um, why has it taken so long? Well, we are here, so I'm pleased that we've made this step and that we've also been able to take a leaf out of the book of the functioning EU working group on land, where we felt they, they have clear advantages, but because it's EU focused, it doesn't include all the major hitters on, in the land sector. That's why we said to have an additional global working group would probably be good to synergize as much as possible and to increase impact by including as many key stakeholders as possible. You mentioned already that many donors are having to make do with less funds for them to be uh, to be made available to, to do their work. Uh, this also causes with some of the bilaterals to have only one person on one portfolio covering a huge inflation of subject matters and a lot of academic thought going in before going into any kind of implementation further down the line. Could you say sort of as a reverse conclusion that land and those land issues and coordination on that is a priority because there's willingness to form this group and obviously also willingness to actually get going in this uh, group? It definitely is a priority and it was for many donors and, and other related um, players in the past, but I think the window of opportunity has never been as good as now. As you said, the first food price spike has shown us that land is not just a basic resource. It is also a very, a very a resource that competition is increasing over. And this research, research needs to be put to the best use to support development, to support economic growth, and especially to support people's livelihoods. And if you look at Africa, For example, 90% of African soil is not under, under land titles. We can hardly imagine that in the Western world. Well, of course, we have a title to the piece of land we own. Um, so if you look at economic interests in Africa, um, this is a very scary situation. I'm not saying that titling, immediate titling is the only answer, but something needs to happen to um, secure land rights um, for its legitimate owners and users to maximize economic growth and to ultimately support poverty reduction so donors don't have to um, fund the same programs for decades and decades to come. And I think land is incredibly important. If we don't get that right, then, well, maybe even hum the need for humanitarian assistance will increase, and that's something that none of us want. I can see if I saw some statistics lately that you know, some of the international direct purchases of land um, in the development world are done not only by the Chinese, as always claimed, but also by individuals from the United States and so forth actually leading there. So some of our donors as such, or the, the individuals in the donor countries are actually responsible for these large purchases. Um, do you, do you think that there's also a need to maybe do some advocacy within our own countries on the, de on the developed, so to speak, side to, to see and look into this? Or is it just a matter of trying to sort things out on the side of the developing countries? You mentioned that there have been quite a few laudable efforts recently to identify who is buying or leasing what kind of land and what size of land where. 
and uh, we still don't have a clear picture. And that's one of the reasons that motivated the UK to put land transparency on the agenda under the CSG8. We need to have better information, but we should also not get too bogged down on who's buying what where. We should look at um, what is happening and what can support poverty reduction and sustainable development, what practices. And we should look at those and showcase them. So um, I think that is a matter that concerns all of us because ultimately we are heading towards over 9 billion people in the world in 2050. All of these want to eat in the Western world and in the emerging powers. We want to eat well. That needs more land. That is more energy intensive. And land ultimately, arable land, is a very limited source. So we have to, we have to um, use it sustainably, and we have to make sure that it doesn't increase inequality and poverty as opposed to um, reduce it. So ultimately, it's a question for all of us. And we've tried to use this year's G8 summit to put a focus on land so that we discuss on um, questions like how, for example, German investors, British investors, U.S. investors um, invest overseas. How they do it? Do they do it responsibly, whether it's in agriculture or in other land-based investment? That is an incredibly important subject. But that also shouldn't underestimate the fact that in different countries, who invests really, really varies. There are countries where 90% is foreign direct investment. There are countries where almost 100% is national and it's domestic. Uh, that's why I'm saying it's the type of investment, how it's done, how transparently and how responsibly it's done that ultimately counts. And I hope that the donor working group can contribute to showcasing success stories and to, to support international processes like the discussion of negotiations in the CFS on the responsible agricultural investment um, to showcase what works and to make sure that that is upscaled. Well, you just mentioned there's a whole lot of concrete ideas in it. Does this also include concrete ideas that you have in mind for your uh, critical next steps for the group to take? And maybe if you could reflect a little bit if you can see a role for the, for the global donor platform in this. As I already mentioned, we are in the final steps of agreeing on our work plan for the first year or two. And there we had identified four priorities. One was to contribute to developing a manageable global indicator, net, uh, indicator framework towards what good land governance means. I mean, the, the, the uh, ideal on the horizon is that at some point the world will agree on an ISO standard on what glo good global governance is. This indicator framework would also support an emerging post-2015 framework that ideally would have a target on land land rights, land tenure security, and poverty rights. That is another priority for the working group to discuss and form opinions on and influence the negotiations that are going to happen over the next couple of months. In addition, um, we will also, as I said before, look at how the donor group can support the new and take forward the new partnerships that were announced under this year's G8. And we hope that these will not just remain the seven we announced in June, but that we will have additional partnerships that that help to roll out the voluntary guidelines. I mentioned the global voluntary guidelines before, and they are quite important because they are the first globally negotiated and agreed instrument on what land investment should look like, what land tenure security should look like, what the underlying processes should be. And we hope that by coordinating better and and agreeing on, on maximum financing for the rollout, which may look different in every country, that the donors of this world can make this a success story, which is not just agreeing on, on a nice set of international soft law, but in making it happen at the grassroots level so that poverty can be reduced in a sustainable fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you.